Good evening, professor. Good evening, professor, colleagues, and uh, abroad from USA and everywhere. We are here in our second meeting of the Weekend Cafe, which in the cafe is a special program designed for you and for uh, uh, other colleagues that to share their thoughts, their thinking, and the critical thinking, and to answer questions, and probably to uh, introduce their clinical practice in one or more of cases. Today, we have a very exciting meeting with Professor Amr Hosseini, Professor of Nephrology, Kentucky University in USA, and we have a two colleagues team, one from Mansoura and one from Saudi Arabia. I'm sure that uh, this will be a very unique meeting in our second weekend the cafe. Uh, thank you very much for attending that, and we are hoping that we have an excitement here. Professor Am, please go ahead. Thank you so much, uh, uh, Professor Hisham, for taking initiative. And thank you for uh, Shaima and Ibrahim Omar um, for allowing us um, to uh, discuss these scientific materials and the question with them. Hopefully in the future, we can have bigger groups uh, like, you know, Awa'il al Talaba, you know, <laughs> when we have this competition between two um, big groups and each group represent uh, an institution or, or a university or, or something. So I have, uh, I think five or six cases, uh, very quick questions, and we just need to focus on the take home message of these questions. I'll start with the first case. Word case. She is a 68 year old uh, lady who came into the emergency department with history of uh, five month gradual but progressive fatigue, lower extremity edema and the headache. She hasn't been seen by any physician for the last 15 years and she was not taking any medicine. And her blood pressure on arrival was 180 over 110. So she was hypertensive, serum creatine 2 milligram per deciliter, serum calcium 7, ionized calcium 0.9, phosphorus 4.5, BTH was 165. Her echocardiogram and uh, uh, the EKG showed left ventricular hypertrophy. So she has hypocalcemia and uh, BTH is high, normal phosphorus. And the question is, which of the following is not a direct action of BTH? Increased intestinal absorption of calcium, increased activity of 1-alpha-hydroxylase, increased tubular reabsorption of calcium, decrease the tubular reabsorption of phosphorus or increase the bone resorption, which one is not a direct action of the BTH. And the correct answer. Oh, uh, what do you think, Dr. Ibrahim? What do you think, Shaima? And everybody else can contribute, but I think just because we cannot unmute all of uh, uh, you know the attendees, we have more than 160 attendees, I am sharing with the uh, on the chat, and you can uh, share with the uh, uh, the team, both teams. Yeah. <laughs> yes. Okay, very uh, nice. Uh, for me, uh, number A, it's not a direct action of uh, BTH because it is uh, an indirect, not direct action uh, of BTH to increase intestinal absorption of calcium. It uh, affects the alpha one hydroxylation and. Uh, renal reabsorption of calcium and renal excretion of phosphorus, but direct intestinal absorption of calcium is not included. It is an indirect because by activation of vitamin D, vitamin D, uh, it is the one that increases uh, calcium absorption, not direct uh, effect. And your colleague, Khaled Abu Zaid, are in agreement on the team? Yes, I totally agreed. Thank you very much. Very good, very good. And uh, uh, the chat all of, uh, all about A. So uh, nice. this is an alignment with the uh, grid team. You have one point here. So next question will be for the other team. Okay, let's. Uh, I'll give you some rationale about this answer. Answer is increased intestinal absorption of calcium. So BTH, of course, as we know tries to keep the extra serum calcium concentration with a normal limit, 
by working on different organs, mainly on bone, kidneys, and small intestine. But its action on the bone and the kidney are direct, but its action on small intestine is indirect, and I'll show you this in a minute. So in the bone, the BTH stimulates release of calcium <clears throat> and indirect process through osteoclast. So because it increases the bone turnover, increases the bone resorption. My other question that is not included here, how does BTH work? Where is the BTH receptor? Is it on the osteoblast or osteoclast or osteocytes or other, other cells? We are all talking about high bone turnover in vision with hyperparathyroidism. How does this happen at a molecular level? Okay. How does BTH stimulate the bone resorption? Does it have a direct effect on osteoclast or osteoblast or osteocyte or all of the above? What do you think, uh, Dr. Ibrahim? I think uh, this is a question for the second team. Uh, yes, um, uh, I think uh, BTH uh, act uh, um, uh, on uh, osteoblast receptors. Uh, it uh, increases uh, the rank L, which act on uh, the rank receptors on the osteoclast. Uh, so uh, BTH uh, indirectly stimulates uh, osteoclast, which increases the bone resorption. Very nice, very nice. Dr. Isham, do you know that Dr. Ibrahim Omar and uh, Dr. Shaima, they were with us in the CKD MBD uh, graduate certificate program. So they are very knowledgeable with the CKD MBD stuff. I'm happy to see that. Yes, uh, we are all happy. And on the chat as well, I think uh, all of them are the same answer. So both uh, the uh, great team uh, on the chat and the team uh, on uh, the voice are correctly. And if you have any additional comment on the basics of that, you can go ahead. By the way, I was in a meeting in United States and I asked the nephrologist there, how does the BTH work? Is it on the osteoclast or the osteoblast? What is the direct action? The majority of them, they choose osteoclasts, which is a wrong answer. They actually, the BTH receptor are on the osteoblast, as uh, Dr. Shaima said, and when it stimulates the um, uh, rank L secretion from osteoblast, rank L goes to the osteoclast and start to activate all the stages of osteoclastogenesis and increase bone resorption. But that's very good. I think we have better knowledge and understanding now of the CKD, MVD uh, molecular uh, pathology. Which ultimately leads to resorption of the bone. However, it doesn't also have a direct action on the osteoclast. It's important to know that BTH receptors are on the osteoplast, not the osteoclast. So um, the BTH receptors on the osteoplast increase expression of rank L and decrease osteoprotegrin. And the rank L, it stimulates the osteoclastogenesis while BTH inhibit osteoprotegrin that allows for pre-differentiation uh, of osteoclasts. So it has direct effect on the osteoblast, but indirect on the osteoclast. What about the kidney? The kidney, the BTH has three functions. It increases the, the calcium reabsorption mainly in the proximal convoluted tubule and also in the ascending loop of Henle, but also the BTH targets the distal convoluted tubule and collecting duct directly and increase calcium reabsorption. What about phosphorus? BTH, of course, is a phosphatoric hormone, so it decreases the phosphate reabsorption in the proximal convoluted tubule and the phosphate um, combine uh, with the calcium and form insoluble molecule. So higher phosphorus in the blood decreases the calcium and vice versa. So here when the BTH decreases the phosphate reabsorption, it actually increases the ionized calcium in the blood. 
starting from the kidney, the BTH stimulates the production of one alpha hydroxylase in the proximal convoluted tubule, and the one alpha hydroxylase is required to catalyze the synthesis of the active form of vitamin D, the 125-dihydroxycholecalciferol. So from the inactive 25-hydroxycalciferol to the active form, it's very important. So BTH stimulate one hydroxylase enzyme. One hydroxylase enzyme actually inhibits the BTH. It's called a closed negative feedback mechanism. So again, um, the PTH stimulate one alpha, uh, the hydroxylase enzyme that stimulate the active form of vitamin D synthesis. The active vitamin D plays a role in calcium reabsorption in the distal convoluted tubule via the calbendin D, a cytosolic vitamin D dependent calcium binding protein. But the small intestine doesn't regularly have any PTH receptor. It has vitamin D receptor, but it, uh, it doesn't have uh, PTH in the small intestine. Vitamin D allows absorption of calcium through an active transcellular pathway that need energy and the passive or inactive barrier pathway that doesn't uh, usually need energy. So there is no direct action of the BTH on the, the intestine. The intestine action is through the vitamin D. The small intestine has, uh, you know, plenty of uh, vitamin D receptor, but it lacks any uh, BTH receptor. So uh, the action of BTH on the intestine is indirect through stimulation of vitamin D, uh, the 125, the active form through stimulation of the 1-hydroxylase enzyme. BTH1 receptor is a classic BTH receptor as expressed in high level in bone and the kidney, but not in the intestine. Here are the reference. Thank you so much. And uh, uh, we can clarify, Professor uh, um, just for uh, the exam. Uh, I'm talking here about the exam. What is the tricky question about if we put here bone resorption, all the audience will go to osteoclast. So, and if you are talking about primary action, we will go on uh, osteoclast. So, uh, I think if, if what 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 a, a, a candidate can choose if you put an what about the PTH action on bone resorption, they all choose osteoclast. But the main action on osteoclast and secondary to osteoclast, as you uh, perfectly mentioned. But I'm talking here about an MCQ exam. Right, right. Absolutely, I agree with that. Um, it's it's tricky because yes. also the BTH stimulates <laughs> bone resorption, but we need bone resorption to stimulate bone formation. That's called the coupling effect. Yes, to exactly. Yes. Form, forming a bone, you need to resolve bone first. The first stage of the bone remodeling cycle that will end up by having more bone formation is to start to break out and to eat and resorb the bone. This is the first stimulus. If you don't do that, you are not going to form a new bone. If you are not, it's like, you know, catabolism and anabolism, okay? Destruction and building. If you want to build a new home or house, you cannot build it on an old house. You have to demolish, you have to take out the old house then you build up a new new house. So uh, this is what happened in uh, a dynamic bone disease. There is no bone resorption. So there yes. is no need for, for bone formation. So the old become uh, very uh, old and uh, 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 the senescence happen in the bone. So it will be very weak, fragile, unhealthy, and it can break very be easily. Be broken, yes. Right. Great. Okay. Just for yes. clarification for uh, fellowship exam, that's next month for uh, who are uh, going to fellowship exam. Very good. This is the first case. Let's take another case. Okay, we are hearing. Uh, 
Uh, hello, everyone. Today, um, our case is a 49-year-old male patient who is on dialysis, has a history of hypertension. He has been on dialysis for seven years. He has secondary hyperparathyroidism. And he's on a dietary uh, phosphate restriction along with uh, baricalcitol for Mike with each dialysis, severa mercarbonate, three tablets, three times a day with meals. His IBTH has ranged from uh, 351 to 547 uh, picogram per ml in the last six months. A new lab showed that his calcium, the corrected one, according to his serum albumin, is 9.8, phosphorus 5.8, and his uh, IPTH is 773. Which one of the following is the most appropriate next step in this patient management? Would you increase the baricalcitol dose from four to 10 microgram with each dialysis? Would you add 30 milligram of sinacalcid and gradually increase the sinacalcid dose according to the tolerability? Would you stop the phosphate binders? Would you add calcium acetate as uh, another phosphate lowering therapy? or would you refer the patient to parathyroidectomy? Dr. Khaled Abouzid. Hey. Nice, mashallah, every, yani, uh, all our uh, attendees uh, still remembering what you uh, make share before with this case, Dr. Am, it's beta and add uh, 30 milli, milligram sinacalcid and gradually increase its dose according to the tolerability. Because the rest of uh, selection, I think it is not uh, it's not appropriate in a case like that. So as the only so, uh, why why option A is wrong? Can you explain the other options, please? A uh, power calcidol to ten milligram in the uh, dialysis session it will increase the phosphates. It may it may, it may make suppression of uh, BTH because affecting the calcium sensing receptor in the parathyroid gland. But it may increase the calcium more and more. That's why the patient will be in, in a risk of uh, calciphylaxis and metastatic calcification. That's why to increase the dose of the paracalcidol, it will have the risk of hyperphosphatemia and hypercalcemia. And there may be later on uh, tertiary and autonomous hyperparathyroidism and adenomas, especially yeah. the trending of the BTH is just raised like that. So it is, it is not an appropriate uh, in this case. But suppression of uh, sinacalcid, it, it, it will uh, make gradual uh, controlling of the BTH uh, release. And uh, plus, uh, uh, continuing the other, uh, the other parameters like phosphate binders uh, and the calcium supplementations and the diet control, plus uh, dialysis. What would actually... be the effect of sinacalcid again on the phosphorus level? Please, Khaled, can you explain it? Sinacalcid, uh, it, 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 may, it controls the BTH level. It will not affect the not the phosphorus. Uh, the, 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 the phosphorus. Sinacalcid is the membara, yes? Yes, the membara is BTH is not the phosphorus. Does it do any effect on the phosphorus? It have some. It has. It have some. It have some uh, uh, effect in the in the phosphorus level, but it's mainly for the BTH. What, what kind of effect does it uh, increase or decrease the serum? Decrease the phosphate. It, it decreases the phosphate. And How the root. Not increase uh, the phosphate yeah. like particles. Uh, and the root, yeah, Khaled. And the root of uh, lowering the phosphate is important. How uh, actually, does this happen, uh, Dr. Khaled? Yes. I, as I, I, with, with, uh, with controlling the level of, uh, of the BTH, the correlation between the calcium and the phosphate will be returned back to the normal hemostatic condition by increasing the calcium level and the reduction of the phosphate level. Phosphate will be reduced by the sinacalcid by, uh, by uh, I'm, I'm not sure exactly, but I think it's working through the receptors 
calcium sensing receptor to increase the calcium level and the reduction of the phosphate level. But how it works in patients with end stage kidney disease on dialysis for seven years? Yeah, my question is how does it decrease the yes. serum phosphorus level? If you know, say yes, I know and 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 explain. No, it. no, no, I don't know. I don't know exactly how cynical set making. Very good. We don't have to shy to say I don't know. Okay, Sayedna Omar said no, I don't know. It's uh, yes, I can add, please. I can add, please. Okay, you are one team. Yes, oh, right. Yes, cynical um, uh, set has a negative uh, effect. On both calcium and phosphorus, by uh, because mm -hmm. uh, the main re the main uh, release of uh, phosphate and hyperparathyroidism from bone. So by the negative effect on on bone, it will decrease both on both of calcium and uh, phosphate. So in this patient, as uh, BTH is high and uh, doing a resorptive effect on bone, so releasing more calcium and more phosphate from bone by inhibition of this effect, both calcium and uh, phosphate. So, will... so you mean that then calcium phosphorus are released by high PTH and thinner calcium in diety inhibit PTH level, so it inhibits calcium and phosphorus release. That's what we, you need to say, correct? Yes. Very well, so, very well. So, okay. Patient that will that will have negative balance of both calcium very and very Okay, oh. let's discuss option number C. Uh, this continuous phosphate binders. Uh, I, here in this case, this continuous phosphate binder is not a good selection because actually it. it, it uh, in case of discontinuation, the phosphate will be increased again, and the uh, patient will start to have the same stimulation of the BTH uh, rising level. Very That's nice. why because phosphate the... controlling of the phosphate level is mandatory. Very good, because hyperphosphatemia can stimulate BTH secretion as well. So that's very yes. good. What about option D? Add calcium acetate as a phosphate. It will increase the calcium level also. Uh, that's why it is not, uh, uh, as a phosphate binders, uh, it will not add uh, an extra benefit because uh, calcium acetate, uh, calcium acetate, uh, we, uh, I don't know exactly why calcium acetate is not, uh, it's not used as a phosphate binders here. I think mainly because the patient already have hyperphosphatemia, so the calcium acetate wouldn't actually be a stronger, but can put the patient, as you mentioned, on a positive calcium and phosphate balance as well. And the patient is already, there is a lot of calcium released from the bone, a lot of phosphorus. So this patient is already on a positive calcium and, and phosphorus balance. We don't want to add more calcium, right? Please be in mind that the dialysis uh, has nothing, that modality has nothing to do with the uh, high phosphorus, the modality. Because from high flux hemodiaphoretrician, the difference is the tangible. It's around 700 to uh, 800 milligram per session. So all those cases, we need more prolonged dial session because uh, it appears, phosphorus is a place, the multi-compartmental distribution, three or four compartmental distribution. So uh, I think it is continued, as you said, for state binders, uh, even if you intensify dialysis by frequency, you, you should have uh, such, although in some literature saying that intensified dialysis by nocturnal hemodialysis, prolonged hemodialysis, you can stop uh, phosphate binders. Very nice. It's either prolonged, as Dr. Hisham said, or frequent dialysis. Yes. So it's yes. five, five, five. Yes. Five frequent has a burden. Yes. Frequent has a burden on the vascular axis, burden financially, but uh, prolonged. Uh, is more uh, efficient. What is that? KT over V. I usually say that T is the most, and the, uh, even that the T is the smallest in the equations. KT over V. T is should be the capital letter. Correct. So uh, yeah, this is the reason. The, as Dr. Hisham will explain that that about seventy to eighty percent of our dialysis patients they need some kind of phosphate binders. We cannot only depend on dialysis to clear the phosphorus. Most of the clearance of uh, phosphate on dialysis happen in the first couple hours, usually in the first uh, hour or two. Then the capacity, the removal capacity of the filter uh, go down. 
So, but anyway, it's either to be uh, uh, frequent or prolonged, but mm -hmm. also, uh, you know, they are usually not enough, but only patients who are doing six days of dialysis, these are the patients who might actually have a high phosphatemia rather than hyperphosphatemia. Yes, because of multi multi compartmental dialysis. But bear right. in mind that uh, phosphate is a small molecule. It's around, around 130 Dalton. However, phosphate kinetics uh, has uh, three three parts of water, three molecules of water, making, although it's a very small, tiny molecule, just a double of urea. However, it attains more three molecules making like middle molecules. So it's hardly, uh, it's not clearly uh, by uh, the dialysis like a small uh, uh, molecule like urea or creatine. That's why the average, removal is, is, uh, is hard. Very good, very good points. In average, you need uh, at least 18 hours of weekly dialysis uh, to clear the phosphate load, which is almost impossible, you know, either to do six hours three times a week or three hours six times a week it's too hard but if you can do that by doing a prolonged or more frequent dialysis you might be able to do this but our conventional way of dialysis we're doing right now is not enough to, to remove that sure, sure. okay uh there is some noise dr isham uh can you can you give me just just a chance please okay yeah go ahead please can you give me a chance to have uh, some little comment? Yeah, please, yes. go ahead. Yes, I'm uh, uh, just uh, saying, uh, uh, Dr. Ahmed? Uh, yeah, yeah, yes. Alan, Dr. Ahmed. Uh, for us. There is, uh, there is uh, an article in the Journal of American Society of Technology in 2021 by Professor uh, Shazud and Etel, and they are uh, telling that in contrast to traditional thinking, recent studies, have demonstrated phosphate removal to occur consistently throughout the entire dialysis session. Uh, it occurs more in the first hour, but it occurs all over the session. And uh, uh, that uh, serial blood draws removed uh, that the phosphate return to pre-dialysis level between 20, 40, 48 hours post therapy. And yes, it removes, yes, uh, by magnetic resonance detection, <laughs> The intracellular compartment of phosphorus is affected positively. I mean, uh, beneficially. That is, okay. it removes the intracellular compartment also. Let me comment on Dr. Ahmed. Uh, yes, yeah, sure. Uh, comment. So for a long time, I will send. Reports. I will send the inshallah the, the group this reference. Thank you. Thank, thank you. For several decades, we thought that beyond two or three hours the uh, capability of removing phosphate is very limited, but actually the study that was published a couple of years ago and other studies as well, showed that you still, as Dr. Sham said, with prolonged dialysis, you can remove, of course, more of the phosphorus, but at a lower base, but you can still improve the hyperphosphatemia and improve the phosphate clearance. Uh, you know, they did compare the patient on nocturnal dialysis home hemodialysis, frequent dialysis, intermittent dialysis for three or four hours. And they showed that you, if either if you prolong the dialysis or do more uh, frequent dialysis, you will achieve more phosphate clearance. That's Just actually. one comment until uh, we will move. Uh, I know Chazu, we, uh, we discussed a lot uh, before in the meeting, uh, many times so about uh, phosphate removal, Professor uh, Chazu. Uh, is a French uh, professor uh, and is uh, one of the important uh, professors on Tessin uh, after Tessin has been uh, passed. Uh, yes, it's removed during the session, mostly on the first to second hour, and then coming to a plateau of removal rate, but it still uh, has been uh, removed. Uh, as we discussed uh, earlier, that uh, the dialysis modality will not have the chance to uh, remove more uh, of if you are intensifying during the four hours that just uh, uh, the final comment thank you very much professor ahmed okay yeah. very good very good very very healthy discussion and to have agreement very nice 
So, yes. uh, Dr. Khaled, can you comment? Uh, Dr. Ibrahim Omar have a, have, has a comment. Go ahead, Dr. Ibrahim, and, uh, and explain to us why uh, option E is wrong. Yes, I was, uh, I was, I raised my hand to, uh, to for, for this point, last point for uh, Barathe reduct me, as uh, it is only one rating that is uh, very high. Uh, the trend of BTH before was within target, uh, 350 to 500. And as Birkadeko from 300 to 600, so it is only one reading that is high. So parasitectomy is not uh, recommended in this situation. We need a persistent elevation of uh, BTH over, uh, for example, six months uh, to uh, decide uh, parasitectomy. And some uh, recommendation telling that exactly if it is more than 850 with symptoms or more than 1,000 without symptoms. Thank you. Very nice, very nice. So it's too early, it's premature to refer the patient for birth aridectomy. You have to intensify the medical treatment first, and if you fail to control the BTH to less than, say, 800 or 1,000, you might think about birth aridectomy, but you need to exhaust yourself, increase the vitamin D analogs, put him on a maximum tolerated dose of uh, sinacalcet, control the uh, phosphorus level with phosphate lowering therapies, you know, diet control, all of this, and give him at least uh, six months if the patient doesn't improve, if the BTH is, you know, trending up to a level of a thousand or so, you might consider baratheridectomy. By the way, baratheridectomy in most cases just to change the spectrum from high to low turnover bone disease. And in majority of patients, they end up by having severe adynamic bone disease, hypocalcemia, and terrible consequences. So try to be you know, more selective for these patients who feel the medical treatment and need surgical treatment. And before referring the patient to baratheridectomy, you need to discuss with your surgeon that we need to keep the BTH level both baratheridectomy around 150 to 300 at least, because sometimes they treat uh, our patient with hyperbara as patient with primary hyperbara, and they try to take out most of the barathyroid tissue <clears throat> patient with very, very minimal amount of barathyroid tissue, and the BTH will be in two, uh, you know, uh, digital numbers, and the patient will end up by having uh, a dynamic bone disease and increased cardiovascular calcification. But please, one question, please, uh, in this in this topic, please. Uh, uh, the maximum dose of uh, calcitriol that can be given uh, to suppress BTH because, uh, uh, unfortunately, I saw some practices using up to 10 mic uh, calcitriol uh, every session. To suppress BTH, despite I am uh, I am totally disagree about this heavy dose, but uh, I I want to know if it is safe or not, or if there is a maximum uh, dose for calcitriol to suppress BTH. Not like in this patient, but in in some other patients. The problem with the mega doses of vitamin D analog and uh, vitamin D receptor agonist, it will put the patient on both uh, positive calcium and positive phosphorus balance. And this is the major difference between sinacalcet and vitamin D analog. The calcium mimetic puts the patient on a negative calcium and phosphorus balance. The vitamin D analog puts the patient on positive calcium and phosphorus balance. The other important issue is if your target, say, BTH is around 300, if you decrease the BTH from 700, say, or 600, just to give you an example, from 600 to 300 or 400, using vitamin D analog, and uh, another patient, you decreased it from 600 to the same level of 300 or 400, but using calcium imetic. The impact, you know, despite that the, the, the BTH lowering effect was the same, you know, convert sinacalcet to, to vitamin D analog, the impact on the bone is different. It's not only the impact on the phosphate and, and the calcium balance, but also the calcium mimetic, they suppress the BTH, they decrease the bone resorption without remarkable decrease in bone formation. While the active form of vitamin D, 
they suppress the bone formation. So even with the same degree, the same lowering, uh, you know, BTH lowering effect, still calcet is better because it doesn't inhibit the bone formation. So I try to avoid, you know, giving big doses of vitamin D analog. Uh, we try to combine both of them because they, they, balance, they balance each other. It's very important because you will have to look to the bone, you have to look to the cardiovascular system and the positive calcium and phosphate balance. Uh, very good, very good discussion. Let's uh, listen to the rest of this video, then we'll move to the next case. Uh, Dr. Hisham, Dr. Amr, if you please, if you allow me for just one slide to share, uh, because uh, uh, till now, uh, uh, several of our colleagues are uh, puzzled about what is the effect of senacalcid on phosphorus, and some of them tell it increases phosphorus, it decreases, etc. So I have just one slide, if you allow me. Yes, yeah, sure, sure, it will, sure. It will, it will solve this issue. Okay, please, Professor Atta. I don't know if it is clear. Yes, it's, uh, yes, it's clear. Okay, uh, uh, this is the, the standard knowledge. If uh, anyone who sees something different, please inform me. Because I am astonished now, still till now, some are discussing whether senacalcid will decrease or increase the serum phosphorus, etc. Uh, these are our uh, weapons used in the management of uh, high of uh, um, CKD MBD. Okay, and uh, these are the players: the phosphorus, calcium, calcium phosphorus product, and the IBTH. Okay, and this is the impact of all these medications. Uh, uh, just for uh, my colleague, if you like to just photo this uh, uh, slide and put it on your computer or put it in uh, uh, your mobile, etc. This is standard knowledge present in all the textbooks and in all the magazines. What is the impact of all our these weapons in the players in cases of CKMBD? And this is the key to the management. Without this key, we didn't know uh, just uh, uh, if the arrow is up, it means the increase. If we are using only one arrow, it means a slight effect. If we using two arrows, it means a moderate effect. If using three arrows, it means a, a, a severe effect or marked effect. So if it is very simple, look to the Sina calcet here, what is the impact on all these players all of them decrease. And the most important effect or the most severe effect is on the IBTH. It decreases the BTH markedly, three uh, plus, for example, or three arrows here, and it decreases calcium, phosphorus, calcium, and uh, phosphorus. And actually, any of us who are dealing with a patient with CKD, MBD, and we are looking to this, what is called the players, the phosphorus, calcium, product, IBTH, etc. We are adjusting our medication. These are the weapons in our hand, okay? In order to uh, 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 go to correct all these parameters. This is what uh, I wanted to add. Thank you very much, and I will stop uh, my, uh, my share now. Please, my colleague, if you would like just to photo this, this is a standard. This is not uh, my slide. I uh, brought it from my side. No, it is present in all the lectures. I think uh, Professor um, uh, Lucatelli from Italy, etc. All of these have the same, this standard information. So I become astonished actually in the last few days because I am still seeing some of our colleagues reluctant about the impact of Sina Calcet. And this is a long story for discussing all of this. I think it is established already. Thank you very much for allowing me to uh, slide share. I will stop now. Thank you. Thank you so much, Dr. Assam. I will share again. And that's it. enough for this case. Let's move because of the sake of time. Let's move to another case. Hello, everyone.
Uh, today we have a straightforward question. Uh, which one of these statements is wrong regarding bone cells? Osteoclasts are the most abundant bone cells. Is this wrong? Bone resorption is usually needed to stimulate bone formation and remodeling. Osteoblasts live approximately 100 days. Osteocytes orchestrate bone formation and resorption by sending signals to osteoclasts and osteoblasts. Or on average, bone remodeling cycle takes about three to four months to complete. Which one of these uh, statements is wrong? We have the team of Mansoura taking over. Yeah, go ahead, please, Shaima. So which statement is wrong? Osteoclasts are the most abundant bone cells or bone resorption is usually needed to stimulate bone formation or osteoblasts live around 100 days or osteocytes orchestrate bone formation and resorption or on average bone remodeling cycle takes three to four months. Are you with us, Shaima? Shaima, please uh, unmute yourself. Okay, let's let's uh, try. Yes. Um... Go go ahead, Shaima. Um, uh, osteoclasts are uh, the most uh, abundant uh, bone cells. Uh, is the wrong answer? As uh, osteocytes uh, are uh, the most uh, abundant uh, bone cells. Very nice. By the way, I see the chat. I think uh, most of people they didn't get this right. Correct. Uh, there, is a, 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 there is a bouquet of answers. Uh, okay. So yeah, you have a, a lot of answers everywhere. So we need a more clarification on each point. Very nice. Very nice. Okay. And uh, let, let me, uh, uh, you know, complete the uh, video first. Then I will come back and explain it myself. Okay. Thank you. And the right choice would be osteoclasts are the most abundant bone cells. Actually, osteoclasts are um, just few on the bone surface because they are highly biologically active. And if they are abundant, they are going to eat the bone and induce bone resorption very quick. So the patient is going to lose a lot of bone. The, actually, the most abundant type of bone cells are the osteocytes. And these osteocytes, as you can see here, um, have this elongation. They connect to each other. They cross talk to each other. They are actually mature bone cells. They used to be osteoblasts, but these osteoblasts lay out collagen, which is the protein component of the bone, the osteoid. And these osteoids get mineralized with the hydroxyapatite crystals of uh, calcium and phosphorus. Then these osteoblasts now are trapped inside the mineralized matrix and it change its structure function and become osteocytes. It's very uh, abundant in the bone cells. These osteoblasts have a pivotal role in regulating bone mineral homeostasis. It orchestrates the bone formation and resorption by sending signals to both osteoclasts and osteoblasts. It's the brain cells of the bone. So if just for an analogy, the uh, bone is a bird, the head of the bird would be the osteocytes. The two wings will be the osteoblasts and the osteoclasts. So the brain cells, the osteocytes, send signals to the wings to speed up or slow down and orchestrate its movement. It's the mechanoreceptor and the sensors. It has a lot of endocrine, paracrine, and autocrine functions because it secretes a lot of hormones um, like FGF23, sclerostin, rank L, and a lot of interleukins. Osteoblasts live longer, live about 100 days, but osteoclasts uh, live just for three to five days, not more than 10 days because it's biologically very active, so it doesn't live longer. And the bone resorption is usually needed to initiate bone remodeling cycle. Here are the mononucleated osteoblasts. After it 
uh, completes its function and lay out the collagen, it changes to osteocytes start to communicate with each other through these elongations. And the duration of bone remodeling cycle is usually about three to four months, depending on several uh, factors like hormonal factors and the age and the activity. So younger population tend to have higher bone turnover, higher bone remodeling and also modeling. So in elderly people, it takes about maybe up to six months for the bone remodeling cycle to complete. In younger, it takes two to three months. Here is a reference. Thank you so much for listening. Okay, so uh, my question for uh, Dr. Uh, Ibrahim Omar. So osteoblasts, they live longer. They, le they work on a slower base, right? And they work together. They are like soldiers. The hundreds of osteoblasts try to build up bone. They are laying over the bone surface. They try to replace the destruction and the bone that uh, is resolved by osteoclasts. So osteoclasts are few, but they are they have five to twenty nuclei. They are multinucleated giant cells. Giant cells, yes. They are biologically very active. Then osteocytes, they orchestrate the action between osteoblast and osteoclast. And yes. osteocytes are plenty, they are very abundant in the bone. My question for you, Dr. Ibrahim, how long do the you know osteocytes live on average? No, I don't know really. Maybe uh, I think one I think one hundred eighty days. I'm not sure, but uh, I'm not sure really. Thank you, thank you, thank you for this answer. It's very. This is the best answer. I'm not sure. Very good, Doctor Khaled or Doctor Shaima. Doctor Khaled, was it still here? Yes, yes, yeah, Doctor. Uh, I still with you. Okay. Do you have an answer? He doesn't. He doesn't uh, want to jump up to conclusion. Uh, okay. Okay. <laughs> Take your time, <laughs> Doctor Shaima. Can you help us with this question? Up to they are changing the nurses. Years, Twenty-five years, yeah, Doctor Ram. Oh, okay. How did you get that? To be honest, from Google. I know. <laughs> <laughs> so you are you are muting yourself, Mister. Google. <laughs> <laughs> Mr. Gogol was thinking, not, uh, not uh, Dr. Khalid. Thank you. Yes. Thank you for this, your is a, this is a fantastic answer. Yes, that's, that's <laughs> correct. That's, uh, you know, it's not uh, known for, for a fact, but it's uh, at least 10 to 30 years, on average 20, 25 years, as uh, uh, Dr. Khalid said. So remember, this balance Manager. is amazing because the osteoclast, if they are plenty, or if they, long, if they live longer, they are going to eat the bone. So because they are biologically very active, they are few and they live just for a couple of days. Then they, they die. Somebody needs to be muted, guys. While the osteoblasts, because they work very slowly and they work in, in, in a team and in, in a big groups. So uh, the, the one cell destruction that can happen from one osteoclast in a couple of days, it takes 100 years for hundreds of osteoblasts to repair the bone, okay? So this balance is very important. So the number and the biological activity of the cells and how long the cell live is very important, this balance. Osteocytes, they don't form a bone, they don't destroy bone or destruct bone or resorb bone, but they control the balance by secreting hormones and cross-talking with other cells and uh, with each other to control the bone turnover. Clear? Thank you very much for this uh, clarification. Yes, it's very clear uh, for, uh, for all of us, yes. I thought we have we can have a room for six uh, cases, but uh, we are already, you know, started uh, two hours ago. Is this enough or do you want any further cases of uh, uh, we We can have an answer on the chat. Do you want to continue one more or we can, uh, get back in a couple of weeks 
according to your time. Uh, <laughs> uh, uh, old people are exciting. Well, there is are, a, what there we call three. selection. There is selection bias here because people <laughs> who want me to stop, they are they are going to shy away from saying that. <laughs> so we can have one more uh, quizzes. I I really enjoying that. One more. Okay, let's choose. Uh, this one. And this is a democracy in the group, so I am asking the group. Very nice. We ask the group, but we do whatever we <laughs> what, Whatever we, well, yes, <laughs> what, what we see, yes. <laughs> democracy in decision, yes. Right. Okay. We have a straightforward question regarding bone mineral storage. Which one of the following statements regarding mineral storage in the bone is wrong? More than 99% of the calcium in the body is stored in bone as hydroxyapatite. 98% of total phosphorus is stored in bone as hydroxyapatite. 60 to 65 percent of our body's magnesium is stored in the bone about 43 percent of our body magnesium is stored in the bone the majority of zinc in the human body is stored in the bone which one of these statements is not correct and okay so uh who wants to take this question shaima Or Khaled or Ibrahim Omar. Whoever. I think about about forty three percent of the total body magnesium is Yes. What is the what is the wrong answer? The wrong answer D forty three. And if we look to the choice from A to to E. Uh, we'll choose one of, of uh, magnesium, either 60 or 40. Uh, but uh, to my knowledge, 43 is, is, is wrong. Manganese, not magnesium, I'm sorry. Yes, manganese, manganese, yes. Oh. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> Let's make your life harder now. Okay. Yeah. Let's, let's start. I know that um, might be a tough question. So does everybody agree that more than 99% uh, yes, of the calcium. I think uh, uh, yes. the answer will uh, be. B, that's correct. Thank you, Shaima. Okay, yes. so uh, the question for you, Shaima, because you got all the, the uh, answers right. It is not what the you... number, it is a component. What's that? It is the number or a number and the component, hydroxyapatite. It's the percentage of the calcium in the whole body or the percentage of each of these minerals in the whole body. How much is it the in the bone? Yes. Right. And how much is extra skeletal? So uh, the, my question for you, Shaima, 99% of the calcium in our body is stored in the bone. So what is the percentage of our serum calcium compared to our total body calcium. So when you say the serum calcium is say nine milligram per, per deciliter, how how much? What is the percentage of this to the total body calcium? It's all point to all something because actually it is one kg of calcium. Total body calcium I is think one. Kg. It, uh... 0. 0. 0. 0.1 percent. Yes. Very good. That's one out of a thousand. That's 0.1%. Exactly. It's less than that. So I'm just telling you this because we are all focusing on the serum calcium concentration, which represents only one out of a thousand of the total body calcium. We have to look bigger. We have to see other compartments because calcium, 99% of the calcium is in the bone. Okay, what about the rest, 1%? The 1%, 99% of the 1% is intracellular. We cannot measure that. We cannot measure the calcium in the bone. I mean, there's some 
uh, you know, exams for that, but I'm just telling you, you know, on the based on a blood test, you cannot measure the bone calcium, you cannot measure the interosseular calcium using the standard techniques. Then, so that's that's 99% in the bone, then 99% of the extraskeletal bone is interosseular, we cannot measure it. Then the one out of a thousand left is distributed between interstitial and intravascular space. Then in the intravascular space, it's distributed between the albumin bound, about 50% are bound to albumin globulin and others, and about 50% are free. The free component, which represent half out of a thousand of the calcium is responsible for the majority, which is what we call it ionized calcium or the bioactive calcium. So if you see any small fraction, uh, either up or down in this extracellular calcium concentration of the ionized calcium, this means that there might be um, a huge change in other compartments. And let me tell you another sentence. Please remember that. There is no correlation between the serum calcium level and the total calcium balance. The patient, please do remember this again. There is no correlation between serum calcium level and total calcium balance. The patient might have hypocalcemia, but is on a very high positive calcium balance and vice versa. Okay, that's why I am I, I am always uh, teaching juniors that uh, if you have a uh, serum phosphorus, for example, about uh, three or four or four point five, for example, in patient CKD, don't consider even this is uh, normal. They have a load of phosphorus in the body, despite it it may, it may be in the normal range in the blood sample. So both, both, uh, so both applied uh, for the calcium and the phosphorus, and uh, phosphorus load is much more than what we expect in patients uh, with CKD, not on dialysis. Correct. So this is the reason you have to look to different compartments. You need to see what's going on in the bone before talking about calcium and the phosphorus because the majority of these minerals are in the bone. So bone activities, bone remodeling, what we talked about right now, about osteocyte, osteoclast, osteoblast, and the function and bone turnover and bone remodeling cycles. Because by the end of the day, these are going to dictate what is going on with the serum calcium or serum phosphorus concentration. More with the serum calcium. A little bit less, the serum uh, uh, phosphorus level, the, the, the bone phosphorus is about 85% not more than 90%, since the reason that Shema told us that 98% is too much. But anyway, uh, it's it's very um, prominent and eminent for the calcium, but also uh, it's important uh, to look to different compartments when we talk about calcium and phosphorus, homeostasis and balance. What about magnesium? That's right, 60 to 65% of the magnesium is stored in the, in the bone. By the way, magnesium, is a potent inhibitor of cardiovascular calcification. Our patient, the, despite that, majority of them, they don't have hypomagnesemia, but they could be magnesium deficient. And um, there, there is difference, you need to understand, there is different difference between total magnesium deficiency and hypomagnesemia, because hypomagnesemia is based on a blood test, but the blood test, even in dialysis, there is a lot of studies showed that patients on dialysis, even they are not hypomagnesemic, they have total magnesium deficiency. The acidosis itself can mask the magnesium deficiency. The patient might be magnesium deficient despite that the serum magnesium level is normal. And there are several studies show that if you put the dialysis patient on a higher mag dialysis magnesium, you uh, would actually suppress the cardiovascular calcification or retard or delay the progression. Okay, uh, the manganese, 43% of manganese in the blood and the majority of the zinc is in the blood. Let me 
uh, try to finish here. I'll let uh, the video uh, play for uh, two minutes, then we can conclude. The right answer is 98% of total phosphorus is stored in bone. This is wrong, and I'll show you why. So the bone matrix acts as a reservoir for number of minerals that are very important and pivotal in our body, especially calcium, phosphorus, magnesium, manganese, and the zinc. These minerals are incorporated into bone tissue. These are the inorganic component of the bone. The bone has organic component, which is the protein material that uh, compose the osteoid or the matrix, which is collagenous and non-collagenous, and also includes cells as osteoblasts, osteoclasts, and osteocytes. These are the organic components, while minerals are the inorganic components. And um, these minerals are stored in the blood, are stored you know, in the bone from the blood, and if needed, the bone can give it easy to the blood. It's physiological reservoir and uh, compensatory and adaptive, the bone can move in or out these minerals in the circulation. We should know that 99% of the calcium in our body is stored in the bone as hydroxyapatite. By the way, only less than one per thousand of our total body calcium is in the extracellular uh, form that we can measure. The rest, the vast, vast majority, uh, 99.9 .9 are not in the extracellular uh, form. What about phosphorus? 85 to 90 percent of the total phosphorus is stored in the bone as hydroxyapatite. So 99 of calcium, about 85 to 90 percent of the phosphorus is stored in the bone. What about magnesium? 60 to 65 percent of our body's magnesium is stored in the bone. And manganese is about 43%, and approximately 30% of the zinc is stored in the bone. Zinc is uh, not only a component of bone, but also essential cofactor for many protein, enzymes, and hormones, and also involved in the microstructure stability of bone remodeling. So here, you need to this percentage. 99% of the calcium is stored in the bone, 85% of the phosphorus, 60% of the magnesium, 43% of the manganese, and 30% of the zinc is stored in the bone. I think uh, this is easy to remember, and we should know that bone is very essential storage, one of the biggest storage in our body. And thank you so much. By the way, the last thing I can tell you that uh, uh, I already shared uh, tons of these videos on YouTube. Uh, so if you are interested. Uh, yes, please uh, share on the group, Professor Ham. Absolutely, yeah. You, you <laughs> see here, you bought my name here. This is my channel. And these all videos are five minutes or less. So it's short videos just to give you a take-home message how to understand very, yeah, various uh, kidney and bone uh, problems. Uh, thank you very much. There is uh, some questions, but we uh, can move and uh, answer later on. Uh, it's uh, great. Uh, uh, Russia uh, thinks that what about vascular calcification. Russia, I can give you a vascular calcification talk later on because uh, Professor Amr uh, uh, sharing his experience and uh, but if his uh, time is not available, I can share with you uh, the vascular calcification. Uh, other one, no, no other questions, I think here. I just I have one question, it's just to, to terminate that. Uh, considering just I memorized that vascular calcification depends largely on the phosphate in the mono or pi physic. Uh, phosphate, uh, and if you change the mono to dye, phosphate by metabolic acidosis, per se, vascular calcification are enhanced. Just a, a short question, 
that I was teaching before uh, my uh, in the uh, uh, my talks. The metabolic acidosis per se enhance vascular calcification through this way. So if you have uh, any uh, comment from your side, Professor Lam. Uh, yeah, very quick comment. Actually, uh, there is something called dialysis paradox. I don't know if you will agree with this or not. But actually, some of cardiovascular uh, experts, they thought that dialysis can, uh, you know, might put the patient on increased cardiovascular calcification risk. They are saying that three times of dialysis a week, three, four, three or four hours, put the patient on uh, increased uh, phosphorus and calcium deposition in the tissue because of the several things. First, we, we talked about the capacity to remove the phosphorus uh, you know, by dialysis is, is not great. Second is that the dialysate calcium is usually higher and the the patient on a positive a calcium positive, yes. balance. Third, uh, the patient usually start on the acidic side and ends, you know, the mean, if you look to the mean, uh, pH uh, before and after mm -hmm. dialysis or the serum bicarb, for example, if you start with a mean of 20 or 21, you end up by you know finishing dialysis was 28, yeah. 29, correct. So you we know and we discussed this in kidney stones, phosphate actually precipitate in alkaline media. You remember yes. that? We discussed this. Yes. Even if you alkalinize the urine and the vision has calcium phosphate stone, you're going to precipitate more kidney stones. Same thing. If you alkal if dialysis induce the same thing and put the patient on the you know alkaline side by the end of the dialysis and put the patient on higher calcium uh, balance and doesn't remove the phosphate very efficiently, all of these might put the patient on increased risk of cardiovascular calcification. Why our dialysis patient are at huge risk of cardiovascular calcification? There is, you know, we know that there is promoters. For calcification. Yes, uh, Fetwin, I published that one of the Fetwin uh, probably 15 years ago that uh, one of the major players. Uh, uh, right. So, right. So, other thing, as Dr. Hisham said, Fetwin and other inhibitor clotho and other uh, protein that might inhibit cardiovascular calcification can be also removed. Some of them, they are plenty. And what we ignore are much more than what we understand. So we can remove, there is possibility that the alces can remove some of the, uh, you know, inhibitors of cardiovascular calcification. It's uh, still, this is under investigation. I just want to share with you that there is a possibility that's called the dialysis paradox that can increase uh, the calcification, uh, you know, by doing more often or, or, or you know, or doing even dialysis. Uh, I cannot say that it's it's hundred percent correct, but it's a concern that has not been resolved and still under investigation. Yes, that's agreed. We will uh, postpone discussion on vascular calcification. I think uh, my question was an appetizer to the group. All are asking about vitamin D calcification, whatever. So I will postpone discussion of vascular calcification. We put in our agenda. Uh, how uh, to discuss all vascular calcification later on. Uh, but at this moment, uh, I think we have uh, more than uh, two hours, 15 minutes. And uh, it was a very lovely uh, meeting and very, very illuminating discussion. Thank you very much, Professor Dr. Amr, for your time and effort. As usual, we have learned a lot from your side. And thanks for our colleagues for our second uh, week and uh, cafe we will meet again this week inshallah by clinical skills number four and we'll move later on on the agenda as uh, will be on the chat thank you very much dr Ham, and thanks for, thank for all of our colleagues thank you the professor hisham and uh, thank you so much dr Hassan, dr khalid abuzid ibrahim omar and shayma thank you very much Thank you, Dr. Hassan. Thank you very much.